It is the 16th November 2012 and this is another edition of the Health Research Report. Well to start off with, I know a lot of us like to wash our hands and we wash our hands a lot. This is the United States who loves sanitation. In fact we come out with soap which is so powerful it's been able to kill almost all the bacteria on your skin all together. So much so that basically even kills the bacteria in our water supply, soil, all the way down the line. What is this magical mystery soap we're looking at? It's something called triclosan. T-R-I-C-L-O-S-A-N. A very, very powerful antibacterial agent. Well, they discovered something interesting when it comes to kids. This antibacterial soap, which we love to clean our kids a lot to and teach them these antibacterial rags, touch, you know, chopping cart, the whole lineup, is it may be related to allergies. How so? Well, the Norwegians, and let's see who did it, the Norwegian Institute at Pacific Health did the study. In combination a little bit with the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey that we do here in the United States. Well, they looked at our kids and through your analysis decided to test your levels of this wonderful antibacterial soap in the urine. Well, the Norwegian kids came back 50% tested. And for here in the United States, our kids about 80% because we're cleaner. So, what they discovered was that this triclosan, which is in the 80% of our children in the United States, so much so you can detect it in urine tests, is that basically it rose a couple of allergens in the blood, preferably what we call immunoglobulin, IgE, and also something to, uh, I should say, which is related to what's called rhinitis. Or I should say they had more rhinitis, I apologize. And so they found, found a direct correlation between levels of the triclosan soap, antibacterial agent, sure, I shouldn't take that back. It's not soap per se. It's an antibacterial agent we like to add to soap and other cosmetic products. And how bad the allergies were in these 10 year olds. Now the interesting part about it is in Norway, they're aware of this and tried to cut back on these, these antibacterial agents. United States, no, we haven't cut back much at all. In fact, so much so, you have to realize 75% of our toothpaste now contains this antibacterial agent triclosan. And we know how important a good bacterial balance is for the teeth itself. And if you know, of course, if your bacterial balance in your mouth goes out of whack, it can do a whole new slew of things. You'll have very, very clean um, decaying teeth, maybe. I don't know, but you may want to check it out. But outside of that, if you're interested in reducing the likelihood of allergies in your children, you may want to go to good old-fashioned soap, which has already been shown to be equally as effective as this triclosan soap, or I should say triclosan antibacterial agent we add to soap. Go back to the old stuff. It works. It's been shown in hospitals to work just as well as this new age stuff, and ironically, without causing allergies in your kids. All right. So, and also in a whole slew of other cosmetics too, you'd be shocked when you find this stuff. And it's T-R-I-C-L-O-A-S-N. All right, now we go to vitamin C. Why is vitamin C important? Obviously, we're told we don't need it because we get plenty of it in our diet through uh, local media sources. But, however, why take that chance? Why do I say that? Because during pregnancy, it's incredibly important. They discovered this. That if a pregnant, well, obviously a pregnant mother or someone that's pregnant, uh, does not get enough vitamin C, that it permanently damages the brain of the child. They said, and well, let me work back this up. This was printed in the Public Library of Science. They showed the maternal vitamin C deficiency during pregnancy can have serious consequences for the fetal brain. And once brain damage has occurred, it cannot be reversed by vitamin C supplements after birth. This was shown through new research at the University of Copenhagen and published in the Public Library of Science. Again, they said the new results sharpen the focus on the mother's lifestyle and nutrition status during pregnancy, nutritional status during pregnancy. The new study has also shown that the damage done to the fetal brain cannot be repaired. So that's something real important to think about, especially if someone's planning to get pregnant. Or not planning, I should say, and not getting pregnant. 
that vitamin C status is incredibly important. They also said about 10, 10 to 15 percent of the world population is deficient. The United States, ironically, that may be higher to diets and be have more processed foods. But we don't know what an ideal level of vitamin C is. I know we like to shoot for the lowest bar, say, oh, if I got 60 milligrams of vitamin C, I'm perfectly fine. But that's not what we should be shooting for. You may want to add a little bit of vitamin C to the diet. That's what they strongly recommended, is a multivitamin includes an adequate amount of vitamin C. Again, you don't get enough, you may be causing permanent brain damage to that fetus or newborn child. Now, another thing that's good, obviously, for the mother too during pregnancy, these two articles happen to coincide with each other in different places. This was printed from the Canadian Journal of Psychiatry, the 15th of November, 2012. In the news, often you'll hear the horror stories, what's called postpartum depression. You'll hear justifications for medications, from antidepressants, to anti-anxiety medications. Well, what they discovered, the Canadians discovered, was basically what we kind of suspected. That if the omega-3 fatty acid levels are low in the mother's diet, that the baby will rob that omega-3 from the mother to build its brain. Why is that important to the mother, per se? Because they hypothesize that omega-3s may be related somehow to serotonin processing the brain. Or, even more so, they were discovering, not necessarily these guys, that inflammation plays a role with depression, too. And we know omega-3s play a role with that. Now, remember, DHA is part of the omega-3 family. And DHA also results in elevated IQs in children who are born to mothers with higher omega-3 or DHA, I should say, fatty acid content in the diet. So it's something to think about. If you're worried about or have a history of postpartum depression, you can do something about it. Make sure you're getting adequate omega-3s from a clean source, one that is tested to be free of mercury and contaminants and things along those lines. And maybe that six-week period of time of postpartum depression really kicks in, you can make a huge difference and make it a lot more enjoyable. Again, they said it's been found in the U.S., most people do not consume enough of this omega-3 fatty acid. We're not talking other fats, processed fats. We're talking good fats, not the type you get at your fast food restaurant. Good quality fats from fish, from egg, from basically nuts, sourced along those lines, which are not heavily cooked to the point where they denature the fats themselves. Denature meaning destroying or basically making them rancid through heat. So, omega-3s, Talk to your doctor about it, get a good level, and you can make it a lot more enjoyable. Not only build the IQ of the newborn child, but at the same time, too, reduce the likelihood of postpartum depression. All right, and then we go to the last one. And this may date this research report, but I wanted to put, bring it up anyways. It goes down to Prop 37. It turns out that California hasn't really finished voting. I shouldn't say voting. Well, actually, I take that back. All the votes have not been counted yet in the state of California. Now, basically at that time, when the votes were tallied in a Proposition 37 was basically slated for a defeat, there were still uh, about 3.3 million votes not counted. They are still counting them. Does not mean that Prop 37 is going to win, but until all the votes are counted, the game is still in play. That this time right now is November 11th. There were 5,205,044 saying no to 4,619,580 saying yes. So that's just something to keep in mind. So Prop 37 we won't know until approximately December 7th. And the Secretary of State has December 14th to certify the results. And the Organic Consumers Association is doing a decent job. They want to look at the, what the preliminary polling was, what people were saying they were going to vote on before they went to the polling booths, just to double check to make certain that these electronic voting machines aren't um, operating improperly through other improper people, so to say. Which, if it does, the OCA will automatically lobby a suit and get into those machines to find out what's going on. And possibly, too, it could just be that basically there may be enough votes if it trends properly, where Prop 37 can pass. 
No reason to get the hopes up. But however, though, 3.3 million votes not counted in about a six hundred four to six hundred thousand dollar variation, the game is still afoot and it can be anybody's game, so to say, until it is all done. Doesn't mean it's gonna pass. Just means hypothetically it still can. Doesn't have a great shot, but the projected uh, loss of Prop 37 was a little early and a little presumptuous. Obviously because that played into the hands of some people which were, had a lot of money invested in it not passing. And again, Washington State's going to put Prop 37 like ballot on uh, Prop 37 like ballot measure to the vote in 2013. So it definitely created a trend that that's just the first shot in the battle, so to say, in regards to labeling GMO. And uh, eventually, those GMOs are going to get labeled because it's not going to stop. All right, 16th of November, 2012. We are done for today, and I'll catch you in a bit.